Poland is where big things happen. In 1989, <clears throat> um, and I, I, as a journalist, actually was there in 1989 uh, covering uh, some of the events. I met uh, Lech Wałęsa, um, and the ambassador said that I have one up on him, by the way, because he has not yet. <clears throat> but I promised to introduce them if uh, the opportunity arrives. <clears throat> but uh, in, um, uh, in 1989, uh, the, the Polish ambassador, the then ambassador, uh, Jan Kenast, uh, gave a talk on how so the Solidarity Movement had opened the way for Poland to become a democratically governed state. <clears throat> Ten years ago, uh, the then ambassador of Poland, uh, Richard Schnepf, uh, talked about the budding U.S.-Polish defense relationship. And four years ago, in 2017, Ambassador Piotr uh, Wilczek uh, talked about Poland's growing concern about Russian aggression against its neighbor, Ukraine. And that, of course, began in 2014. <clears throat> this year is different. Uh, for the, the reason for inviting the ambassadors is slightly different this year. Um, when Poland invaded, uh, sorry, when, when, let me try again. <laughs> Poland has not, not, not actually done anything like that, as far as I know. When Russia invaded Ukraine, in uh, February last year, uh, the West, uh, such as it is, united in a remarkable way, and not only condemning it, but in supporting Ukraine in its own self-defense. <clears throat> Here in the United States, there was tremendous support for Ukraine across party lines. Uh, and of course, <laughs> the, the, we've been watching the last few days and found some notable exceptions to that rule. Uh, but no one was more ready to react than Poland uh, because Polish leaders had long, conv uh, long been convinced that Russia, even after the end of the Cold War, was a dissatisfied power <clears throat> that wanted to remove, re to restore its Cold War empire and was ready to invade its neighbors. <clears throat> Here's how Poland reacted. And we got a sampling of this uh, in, in your predecessor's presentations uh, to us. <clears throat> um, Poland today is spending as much as 3% of its GDP on a defense, and, and it's talking about going to 4%, a whole higher, lot, ho higher percentage than Germany. <clears throat> and it has plans to expand its security forces to, to 300,000. Um, in 10 years, according to the IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, Poland will have top tier, if it, if it carries on like this, it will have top tier military capabilities within Europe. But that raises questions. If Poland is now a rising power, what is the Polish vision of European security? What will Europe look like in 10 years? What should it look like? And what role does Poland see for itself in making that happen? Ambassador Majorowski is well placed to answer these questions. He's a graduate of the Adam Mishkovich uh, University in Poznan, and he has a degree in Hispanic studies. Uh, he's fluent in seven, seven languages. He is a journalist by training, and that's also the better. Um, um, in fact, uh, he was the editor of the Polish edition of Newsweek, and I think we, we actually overlapped because I was working on the American edition at the time. <clears throat> um, he was a reporter, editor, and columnist for some of the leading Polish dailies. Uh, then he went into government service as the head of the press office for the presidential chancellery, and later as undersecretary of state in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, before coming to Washington, he was Poland's ambassador to Israel. So he has some tough assignments, some major assignments. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Speaking of invasions, uh, it was not the Germans, it was not the French, it was the Polish army which seized the Kremlin. It was in 1612, embarrassing the Russians at the time. And I'm particularly proud of it, of this feat. Uh, dear Roy, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind invitation and this most warm reception. Without further ado, uh, let me take you on a journey in time. In October 1939, just a month after Nazi Germany invaded my country, and two weeks after Soviet Russia stabbed us in the back. The Gallup Institute conducted a survey in which several questions were asked about the American public's 
attitude towards the war. Let me quote one of them. If it appears that Germany is defeating England and France, should the United States declare war on Germany and send our army and navy to fight? The answer was 71% no, 29% yes. Another poll was taken in May 1940, after German tanks rolled into France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The question, do you think the United States should declare war on Germany and send our army and navy abroad to fight? The answer, 93% no, 7% yes. Uh, the mood changed after Pearl Harbor. I don't think it is necessary today to send American troops or Polish, for that matter, to defend Ukraine. Direct confrontation with Russia would be unconscionable, to say the least. Nevertheless, history has already taught us an important and painful lesson. Inaction, indifference, and complacent isolationism are much costlier than engagement, resolve, and deterrence. We did not stop Hitler in September 1939. We did not contain Stalin in 1945. If we do not stop Putin now, he will return with a vengeance, and the free world will pay a hefty price for its naivete. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, like millions of my fellow countrymen, I was blessed to have lived under both socialism and democracy. I do not regret it. Before 1989, I experienced command economy, poverty, censorship. After 1989, when we shook off the Soviet nightmare, I enjoyed capitalism, equality, freedom of expression. I know the difference. And believe me or not, I can now see vestiges of Soviet mentality in contemporary Russia, ruled by a brutal regime. And I presume our Ukrainian brothers do not desire to fall under the same yoke again. Should the United States care about Ukraine? Should Poland, Germany, Britain, France? If we want the Ukrainians to breathe freedom and not radioactive dust, if we want them to enjoy the sound of uh, happiness and not air raid sirens, if we want them to live and not to die, let us not forget that they fight not only for their dignity, but also for ours. And let us not forget that Gallup poll from 1939. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, speaking of our common goals in the context of the war in Ukraine, it is imperative to plan for the long term, both in NATO and in the European Union. It is useless to gloat over our efforts today as regards military assistance for Ukraine. How many tanks we have provided, how many artillery rounds, how many missiles the Ukrainians have been able to shoot down, how much territory they have recaptured due to our support. There are more crucial questions we should ask ourselves. How to prepare Ukraine and NATO for the eventuality of another aggression? How to increase our deterrence capabilities and steal our resolve in the face of the unabated Russian neo-imperial brinkmanship? First and foremost, uh, we need to stay committed to our obligations with respect to military spending that Roy has just mentioned and modernization of our armed forces. Europe's citizens should feel adequately protected. It is of paramount importance, not only for our mental well-being, but also for budgetary planning and for the needs of our military industrial complex on both sides of the Atlantic. If we are serious about rebuilding and strengthening it, we must make sure that all interested parties, governments, corporations and the public opinion know how much we will be spending on defense in 5, 10 
or perhaps even 20 years to come. Secondly, we should ask ourselves to what extent we will need Russia also in 5, 10, perhaps 20 years to come as commercial partner. Is Russia really indispensable for Europe as major supplier of gas, oil, and other commodities? Is Russia an important consumer market for Polish, German, French, or American companies? Is it actually an attractive destination for Italian or Austrian financial institutions? And last but not least, how should we judge businesses still running their operations in Moscow or St. Petersburg? How should we treat former prominent Western politicians joining boards of Russian oil and gas companies? Thirdly, we should brace ourselves for the upcoming digital revolution and, uh, quite frankly, for the inevitable cutthroat rivalry with China, not separately as Europe and the United States competing or even plotting against each other but as a collective West, in spite of all tensions and all bickering about artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, semiconductor manufacturing, or privacy regulations, we should prioritize our common interests and values over petty frictions. The war in Ukraine is a test of our unity and cohesion. Distinguished guests, um, I will permit myself now to talk for a few minutes uh, about the foreign policy priorities of the current Polish government, just to give you some fruitful thought before the less official part of this event. Priority number one, quite obviously, sustaining Ukraine's military effort in the face of the Russian aggression. The situation on the ground is increasingly volatile and unpredictable. Apparently, both warring parties have reached a stalemate. We are facing a race against time, with the Russians mobilizing more conscripts and regrouping along the front lines, and the Ukrainians awaiting more advanced weapons to contain the Russian advances. Russian troops still insufficiently trained and poorly equipped, nevertheless, a sheer human mass to be reckoned with. Huge losses on both sides. The Russian economy undoubtedly weakened, however, staggeringly resilient. On a more positive note, after a few turbulent weeks of uh, tense negotiations, the West's resolve and political will to fend off Russia's aggression seems to be as strong as ever, with a wide-ranging coalition of countries willing to deliver modern weaponry to Ukraine, in many cases, following Poland's leadership. Priority number two, implementing the conclusions of the recent NATO summit in Vilnius. Key word, deterrence. Russia still feels emboldened, not only to continue its unprovoked offensive in Ukraine, but also to threaten NATO countries, oftentimes playing the nuclear card. Increasing and reinforcing NATO's physical presence on the eastern flank and effectively deterring Russia should be NATO's chief task in the years to come. Priority number three, putting Belarus back in the spotlight. Alexander Lukashenko's ever-tightening alliance with Putin's Russia and reprisals against the democratic opposition have been somewhat overlooked by the international community. It's not only about the abhorrent nature of this regime, but also about its complicity in war crimes committed in Ukraine. Priority number four, countering Russian disinformation worldwide. It's of particular importance for me as a former journalist. If you think we are winning the battle of narratives, you are terribly wrong. The Kremlin's rhetoric regarding the war in Ukraine and its origins, falls on fertile ground in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. For a host of reasons, uh, the anti-American, or more broadly, anti-Western resentment being one of them. Moreover, 
at the peak of the Cold War and shortly afterwards, tens of thousands of young people from countries affiliated with the Soviet bloc received scholarships and studied in Moscow or in St. Petersburg. Now, mostly in the 60s or 70s, many of them are heads of state, prime ministers, foreign ministers, ambassadors, lawyers, celebrities, speaking Russian and embracing Russia's propaganda. Uh, there are the assets the Kremlin uses brazenly and with stunning efficiency. Priority number five, shaping the future of the European Union. Since the transition in 1989, the Polish society has been steadfastly and invariably pro-European. Nowadays, according to multiple surveys, approximately 80% of Poles support our membership in the European Union. Nevertheless, the Polish government's vision of the European Union as political entity and a free trade zone does not necessarily coincide with other capitals' priorities. We want the EU to remain, I'm not going to name names as a diplomat, of course. Uh, we want the EU to remain a community of independent nations, strengthening mutual economic ties and cooperating in various areas of common interest. We don't want the European Union to become a federal state, conducting policies imposed by the wealthy and the mighty to the detriment of our own long-term interests, particularly in the domain of energy transition, immigration, or security. Priority number six, striking the right balance in our relationship with China. Of course, we have no doubts whatsoever about the true nature of the Chinese communist regime. Also because we know very well what communism means in all its aspects. However, it is of critical importance for us to maintain channels of communication and to advance cooperation with Beijing, predominantly in the economic sphere. Finally, priority number seven, continuing our negotiations on war reparations with the German government, Poland requests compensation for human and material losses sustained during World War II, a matter long neglected and unfairly sidelined in our bilateral relationship. From our viewpoint, it is not only a financial but also a moral issue. So far, subsequent German government have refused to even acknowledge the legitimacy of our demands in spite of unspeakable suffering and enormous devastation caused by Nazi Germans in Poland and to Poland in the course of the war, with political and economic implications still vivid today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. If you put on your journalist cap, how would you describe the relationship right now with Germany? And how do you see repairing it? Because once you make the demand for $1.3 trillion in, in uh, reparations, um, the, the conversation sort of comes to a halt. How, how do you get it started again? Regrettably, I cannot put on my journalistic cap again. Um, well, the, the rela our bilateral relationship with Germany is, as you can imagine, pretty complex. Uh, uh, first of all, Germany uh, has been our largest trading partner for decades. We export about one third of our uh, products and services to Germany. Uh, I wish we diversified our economy a little bit to reduce our reliance on the German economy, because if the German economy uh, gets a cold, we get a flu. Uh, anyway, uh, we cooperate, we collaborate, we deepen our economic ties. Politically, it's uh, a little bit more convoluted, if you will, in terms of our long-term relations with uh, Berlin. Uh, the war reparations being one of the most important and most uh, thorny issues uh, uh, in our bilateral contacts. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm uh, as a conservative, uh, I'm, con I'm considered to be a Germanophile. 
back in Warsaw, which doesn't necessarily need, uh, doesn't necessarily help in my uh, political career. But um, I do, and I, I keep repeating also in, in my talks with my American interlocutors, how important this relationship with Germany is. Also in the broader framework of the European Union, Germany is not only our neighbor, it's not only our uh, crucial economic partner, it is also um, a political and economic powerhouse in Europe. We cannot turn a blind eye to Germany's uh, uh, policies, to Germany's expectations, and to Germany's um, intentions to reshape the European Union. We know very well that our views of the future of the European Union uh, diverge. They're not identical, to say the least. Uh, however, we have to be conscious of Germany's role in Europe. It will never vanish. It will remain, it, it, it has been, it is, and it will remain our uh, most important neighbor in terms of uh, politics and policy, and also in terms of our economic uh, development. Uh, that's why it's, uh, you know, it, it is, those are uncharted waters, actually, for us now. Uh, however, we do believe that uh, some issues have not been yet um, sorted out. They should be. Germany has never paid war reparations to the Polish victims and to the descendants of the Polish victims of the invasion in 1939 and the occupation in, uh, from 39 to 45, unlike uh, other countries which have received compensation from Germany, Israel being one of them, but many others as well. So this is an, an, an issue which has not been uh, solved yet, and we expect Germany and the uh, German, the current German government, maybe the, the the subsequent German governments, to at least initiate negotiations with Poland on this particular subject. Hi, um, I just want to ask a simple question. Given the fact that Putin is a war criminal and willing to um, make the other side, make everyone pay any amount of money, uh, uh, cause any amount of destruction. How can this war possibly end? Um, yes, we should support Ukraine. To the last Ukrainian, how can it possibly end? Uh, maybe we, we, uh, we'll just collect the questions and then I will answer all of them. As I look at the EU's future and I see Hungary as an outlier and the current Polish government as a bit of an outlier in terms of um, domestic freedoms. Um, I'm wondering, uh, does the current Polish government uh, uh, look to have influence in terms of being able to restrict press freedoms or judicial uh, independence uh, for the rest of the EU, or is that something they simply want tolerated for themselves? We've been belligerent with Russia for 80 years now. As you pointed out, dating back to the Second World War and the German invasion of Russia. Yeah. What has to happen to resolve that, to, to get back to a peaceful Europe? I know a lot of the belligerence stems from the Western view that Russia wants to attack and control Western Europe. But most of my friends think that's so silly. The population of the United States is, is 350 million. The population of Western Europe is 1.2 billion. The population of Russia is 150 million. And the how, how are they possibly going to take over Western Europe? What's, what, what would they do with it? What would they do with the traffic jams of, <laughs> of, of, and, and welfare checks of Paris and London and, and Rome? Okay. What do you think about all that? Uh, can you give us a peace, peace, hope? I will. Thank you. 
Um, you know, obviously the U.S. has also struggled over the past decade as far as uh, democratic norms. And you mentioned, um, you know, having a value-based um, approach. And so just curious how you saw democracy and upholding democratic values as part of Poland's vision for European security. So I have actually three questions. Uh, first one, um, Poland has spent- uh, Just one is free of charge. Okay. I can pay for the rest too. <laughs> um, so firstly, defense, defense budget is one thing. Um, to build a defense, including uh, purchasing and uh, setting up production facilities is another problem. Um, do you have any uh, proposal uh, to improve the uh, production and the development in defense industry, uh, especially for aerospace for okay. Poland mm -hmm. and for the rest of Europe? Uh, secondly, um, you have mentioned that uh, um, joining with the rest of the rest of United West to uh, counter China. Um, however, in the United States, the defense policy is um, centers around uh, rebalance in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, do you consider that uh, uh, competing interest of the European defense, um, since America is a very big supplier and uh, uh, America defense policy has a key influence on Europe, uh, do you consider that as a competition? Uh, thirdly, um, what is the uh, Eastern policy regarding trade with the uh, previous Soviet Republic, especially uh, Kazakhstan, since um, Russia sells a lot of oil from that region, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be an important alternative for Russian oil and gas in the future. Thank you. Thank you. The most difficult question, but only apparently, about uh, the democratic framework in, in my own country. Uh, quite uh, hilariously, you are talking to a guy who was sacked as a journalist by the previous government. So I had my own experiences, not with the current government, which has treated me pretty well, but with the previous one. And I have about uh, 40 close friends who were fired from the public TV, from, from the, from the state-owned television channel uh, after the current opposition came to power a few years ago. So uh, the question is, to what extent this misperception of Poland having uh, some problems with uh, democratic rules is deeply rooted in the mentality of some Western societies and so of some Western journalists, to put it bluntly. I know people here in America who have an opinion about what is going on in Poland today after reading one op-ed in New York Times. And without speaking a single word in Polish. And without having read a single book on Poland's history. I'm not saying that uh, Polish democracy is perfect, impeccable, because uh, you have imperfections, uh, you have to cope with imperfections if you live in a country which has been free and independent, both politically and economically, for 30 years only. It's a blip in our history, which has lasted more than, uh, than a thousand years. A history of, an, of, an, of the state, of our statehood. So no wonder that we have had to cope with various issues which are completely, or at least relatively, unknown in countries like the United States, France, Germany, the UK, Italy, and Spain. Talking about the judiciary, for example, I know that many of those reforms in that particular sphere have been harshly criticized by our friends and our partners in the European Commission, for example. But I will give you one example. 
so many, without blaming anyone personally, but so many post-communist or strictly communist judges who still work in the Polish judicial system, in uh, Polish courts, as uh, attorneys general, as lawyers, and so on and so forth. What can we do about that? How should we judge those people? And that uh, the same principle applies to many other uh, sectors, spheres, or areas of our political and social life. So many journalists, not me, fortunately, I'm too young for that, but so many journalists who used to work in the communist media in the 80s, for example. And now they are the Cassandras of our media landscape. They criticize the current government because it's conservative and they are liberals. This is one of the factors that I always uh, remind uh, in, 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 in these conversations. It's also about the ideology, not on, only about the rules and the values. It's also because many European governments today are liberal or left-wing, and ours is conservative. So some of the reforms and some of the policies conducted by this current government in Poland may not be to the liking of some liberals and, and uh, leftists in Western Europe. Now, how does this war end? I'm afraid it will be a protracted conflict. You remember, at least some of you, when the Soviet tanks rolled into Afghanistan and when they left Afghanistan after nine years. It was a very long war and a very, a very painful one for the Soviet Union. And just after that war ended, the Soviet Union collapsed. It disintegrated. I'm not saying that after this war in Ukraine ends, the Russian Federation will disintegrate as its uh, predecessor. But uh, I do believe that uh, if you look at Russia's history, both in, in Tsarist times and in Bolshevik times, and even after Russia became an apparently independent state in 1991, all those uh, turmoils and wars Russia was waging, mostly against the, its immediate neighbors, always led to a calamity inside Russia. There were uh, new forms of statehood born from Russia's defeats and Russia's geopolitical catastrophes. So I think that this is a very, uh, um, uh, President Putin and, and Russia, he's Russia, is walking a tightrope today uh, with uh, unpredictable consequences. I, I, keep, I, I'm, I keep hearing uh, from analysts much more knowledgeable about contemporary Russia than me that uh, we could get even someone worse. Even if we get rid of, of, of Putin, uh, somehow, we could get someone worse, someone more nationalistic, more radical, more anti-Western. Um, Hungary is a problem. As you know, we uh, uh, established um, a new geopolitical format, the Visegrad Group, um, four countries, from Central Europe, Poland, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. Now, uh, uh, within that group, our relations with Hungary are essentially frozen because of Hungary's stance on the war in Ukraine and its uh, particular and peculiar relationship with, with uh, the Kremlin. How can we make Europe more peaceful? Deterring Russia. Deterring Russia. Russia is a constant threat. Uh, I don't know whether it's existential or temporary. Still, it is a constant threat to our peace and to our political and economic stability. That's why we have to deter Russia. That's why, um, as I said a few minutes ago, we need more US and NATO presence on Polish soil, just to demonstrate to Russians that we are ready for 
any eventuality, for any insanity on the part of the Russian Federation. Uh, interestingly, whenever I talk with representatives of uh, American business circles, also defense companies, I, I keep telling them, you know, a, a digression, a, a brief anecdote. I had the opportunity uh, and the pleasure to speak with Condoleezza Rice a few months ago during my trip to California. We met in, in Aspen and then in Stanford uh, twice. And um, she said to me, you know, it's, uh, the Russians have to understand that uh, it's risky for them to cross an American soldier in Central Europe, both literally and figuratively. And my reply was, I'm, I concur 100%, but I would add something to this. It should be equally risky for the Russians to cross an American CEO, an American manager, who came to Poland, to the Czech Republic, to Romania, to the Baltics, uh, to open a facility, a factory, to invest in those countries. So we have to um, strengthen also our economic cooperation with America. We have to attract as many American investors as possible to Poland and to other countries in the region. Again, in order to prove to Russians that is that does not pay off to attack Poland or the Baltics or Romania because the Americans would go apoplectic if they saw that their economic interests are endangered, not only political uh, or geopolitical. It is very important also in, in, with regard to our uh, foreign policy. This is, uh, I, I, I try not to overuse this argument in public, but I will tonight. Uh, this is an outrageously cheap war for you folks. Whenever I hear that it's so expensive for the average American taxpayer. It's, uh, I will not use this famous word, but uh, it's not exactly true. <laughs> you have spent uh, just about, uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, 8% of your DOD budget. 8% without a single and I, I'm, I'm going to, to, to put it frankly, without a single body bag with a fallen American soldier returning to Washington, to New York, or to Baltimore, for that matter. The cost to benefit ratio, and I will put it cynically, the cost to benefit ratio is absolutely ridiculous. When you uh, take into account the level and the scale of the degradation of the Russian military capabilities. It's absolutely incredible how much material, material, how much uh, tanks, how, much, how, many, how many tanks, how many aircraft, how many missiles, how many howitzers they have lost so far in this war. And you have really spent a trifling amount of money on this particular uh, conflict, especially in comparison with what you spent in Afghanistan or in Iraq, let alone Vietnam. Uh, Poland's vision, well, I, I have already partly answered this question about, uh, the, about my country's vision of European security. Deterring Russia is of critical uh, importance. Indo-Pacific, I, I, um, in my previous incarnation as deputy foreign minister, I was responsible also for our relations with China, and I, I had the, the privilege uh, to be the, the so-called coordinator of the Polish government in the so-called 17 plus one format, 17 countries from Central Europe and China. Now it's, it's reduced to 14 plus one. Uh, so I remember vividly how difficult those relations with uh, China where, uh, but uh, those relations will remain uh, vital also from our perspective, not as vital as the relations of countries like Germany or France, 
uh, the, the, the economic interests of which are much larger uh, than ours, because there are uh, very, uh, very few Polish companies which invest in China, and paradoxically, not too many Chinese companies present in Poland, because the Chinese prefer to invest in countries which are somehow on the margins of the European Union, not constrained by EU regulations. Of course, they also invest in France and Germany, because those are huge markets uh, with millions of uh, wealthy consumers. Uh, Poland has never been you know, uh, front and center in the, in the Chinese concept of their economic expansion in, uh, in Europe. Of course, we are uh, coordinating our efforts also with our American partners in terms of uh, America's attitude towards China. It's a long-term project, of course. Uh, not very clear, uh, with ups and downs, with uh, uh, recurrent turbulences. But I do believe that Poland has also a, ro a role to play in, uh, in this respect. And finally, uh, trade with both Soviet republics it is a very elaborate game how to, uh, uh, how to drag those countries which uh, were actually founded after the disintegration of the Soviet Union closer to the, to the collective West, closer to the European Union, closer, to put it more picturesquely, closer to our values. Countries like Kazakhstan, countries like Azerbaijan, like Armenia, and many others. There are some... Uh, shifts uh, of which you are probably aware. And there, there is an, an intent on our part, uh, Poland, Germany, France, the European Union, and also America, trying to convince not only the political elites in those countries, but also societies and the public opinion that uh, they should decouple themselves uh, ultimately both politically and economically, from the Russian Federation. Because since the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, they have been uh, terribly, tremendously dependent uh, uh, economically on Russia. Now they are trying to distance themselves a little bit from Moscow, uh, some of them more efficiently, some of them less. But it is a trend which I believe, maybe a little bit too optimistically, but I do believe, that this is a, an irreversible tendency, especially in, in, in Central Asia. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, we do have a virtual question now. Okay. Uh, the, From our the, Zoom audience. <laughs> we do indeed. I love the term. Here's the question. Would you please comment about the recent election in Slovakia? <laughs> huh. I don't speak Slovak. Though I have read one piece on, in New York Times about Slovakia recently. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, well, I, I'm, uh, I am the ambassador of Poland to the United States, and I'm, I'm not even entitled to comment on Slovak politics. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? What is the outcome of the election? Well, uh, uh, we'll see. Um, well, you, you are absolutely right. We are still in this interim period because the new government has not been formed yet. Uh, we'll see. Well, well, the only thing I can say is, of course, that uh, um, a party which has been much more pro-Russian than other parties has won. And, uh, but again, judging a politician by what he said during the campaign is very tricky. What is your advice for young people trying to start careers in foreign policy besides Don't do this. Don't, no, no. <laughs> I know I should probably study up in the linguistics, but... You had spoken a little bit earlier about um, being a young democracy and um, its relations with other dem young democracies. Um, and being from a young democracy myself, um, I wanted to ask something about more so you how... You meant this one. No, <laughs> no, I don't. Even though, you know, obviously. Well, American democracy is still pretty Definitely young, never knocking the US. Um, <laughs> but um, no, um, for the African countries that we know are. What, between, what country are you from? I'm, I'm, I'm from Kenya. Kenya. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Kenya, which is 
what one of the countries I'm discussing it is, but not the only one. Um, how things tend to work with this whole uh, Ukraine, um, Russia, and everybody else that's you know involved and associated with it conversation goes on that side is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, hmm. but at the same time, um, the enemies of my friends. We'll see how we'll handle that, right? It's not always necessarily um, just because you're my friend's enemy that makes you automatically my enemy that I would fight as though I had a personal conflict with you in the same way that you know the US does their um, military operations as well. So I wanna ask you for um, the other young democracies who have varied loyalty one might say, um, both with business, um, in terms of inside and outside the country, as well as, um, you know, engulfing with trade. How would you, what, what would your um, kind of advice or what would your um, personal opinion on propaganda because that's what most people are interacting with the whole, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine, Russia conversation with is through propaganda. I definitely am. Um, so how would you say the propaganda should either, um, if they were trying to encourage the young democracies in Africa towards um, siding with either Ukraine or Russia, what would that propaganda look like? Because right now it's pretty... Some people feel one way or another way or don't really care. Okay. Um, my question has to do with the reparations that you mentioned previously. Specifically, what does ideal reparations look like for Poland from Germany? And specifically, who is included in that request? Current Polish citizens or Polish citizens at the time? Because there is a rather large diaspora of former Polish citizens in no. the U.S. from that time period. And should they be invested in this question? Why should they be invested in that question? Thank you, sir. It all boils down to, to credibility and language, but, but not foreign language. Uh, my, uh, my obsession is to talk with virtually everyone, peddling my own narrative about contemporary Poland mostly about contemporary Poland, because we want to, we want to uh, change a little bit the perception of Poland that is still very, uh, very deeply embedded here in America, but also in some Western European countries. I'm fed up with kielbasa. <laughs> I've had enough. And I'm obsessed with high tech. Uh, just a few days ago, I was in Boston and, uh, when, where I, I, I was meeting uh, with a young lady in, in her 30s uh, who works here for a Polish company dealing with oncological research. Uh, they do things that really Im impressed me when, when she talked. Well, I didn't understand much of what, he was, what she was saying to me, but... Uh, oncological research, and, and she says, you know, Mr. Ambassador, we are planning on taking over a few American companies now. I felt so encouraged and so happy. A Polish company taking over American companies on American soil. This is what I've always dreamed of. <laughs> Until recently, it has been a, a one-way street about uh, 1,500 American companies, or companies with American capital, already present in Poland. Most of them have been investing in our country since 1989. Uh, but very few Polish companies investing in America. It is changing now, but very slowly, steadily, but slowly. We want to change this. And that's why I don't speak with my American interlocutors about kielbasa anymore. I speak about oncological research. I speak about e-banking. I speak about recycling. Uh, while in Boston, 
I also paid a visit to uh, Boston Dynamics. You know those four-leg robots? This is what they make. Uh, and um, I, I had a, a, a friendly chat with one of, of, of the executives, one of the managers, and uh, I asked him, do you have any recycling issues? Well, we do, of course. We, we, we make hardware stuff so with batteries, so we have to recycle those batteries from time to time. So I said to him, you know, there is a Polish company which has been present here in the United States for a few years, uh, a, a, billion dollar, a billion dollar yearly turnover, pretty huge, uh, not universally known because they recycle. They don't make, you know, smartphones or laptops or they don't take over Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> there is a company. Okay, give me a card. Okay, I will put you in touch with, with that company. This is what I do as Polish ambassador. And this is what you should do as a future American diplomat. Elevated pitch. You got two minutes, three minutes. Regardless of the, of the nature and the character of your interlocutor, you meet him in, a, in, in, a, in the headquarters of Boston Dynamics, you meet him or her in a restaurant, you meet him or her in an elevator. You always have to remember that it does make sense to sell your country in the best way possible on every occasion. And speaking about, uh, in this case, Poland's achievements with absolutely everybody and collect business cards because you never know which business card you will use in three, five, or ten years' time. Believe me. That's why, for example, uh, in, my, in my previous posting in Israel, I was, uh, it was during the pandemic, so I had plenty of time uh, to meet on Zoom with uh, young Israelis, many of them in their teens, some of them in their 20s, talking about contemporary Poland. You know very well how complicated our bilateral history with Israel and with the international jury has always been. So it, it, those conversations were not easy for me. Still, I was talking with them and I was telling them stories about contemporary Poland. And many of them were saying to me, Mr. Ambassador, for, for many of them, for example, uh, people a little older in their 30s and 40s, they traveled to Poland during my stint in Israel. They traveled to Poland for the first time in their lives. And they were saying to me, up and returning to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we were expecting to see a post-communist, grey, drab, uninteresting country, the only attraction of which was its cheapness. And then we landed in Warsaw and we saw a colourful, vibrant, dynamic and technologically developed country in the middle no, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Europe. Believe me, they were perplexed by what they saw in Poland. And I was poking fun at them. You know, I, 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 was, I was telling them, I do admire your country. I do recognize your label as a startup nation. I do acknowledge your advances in technology. There's, everything is absolutely gorgeous about Israel. But, and that was my question to them, how come during my three-year tenure in Israel, I never had the opportunity to pay contactless with my credit card in Israel? Whereas in Poland, you, whenever you walk into a shopping mall, you hear that, uh, that constant sound of people paying with no with their phones or with their cars, with their watches, just like that. So, uh, for example, uh, that, that was an argument, again, an elevator pitch, because you will probably remember that, that picture of, of Poles paying with their watches and those poor Israelis still swiping their cards. You won't believe me, but I still, they still use checks. Do you know what a check is? <laughs> 
the person asks you to put on your David Petraeus hat <laughs> and tell us how you think that war is going to end. Not how you want it to end, but how you think it will end. Over. Well, those are two different questions, actually. I, I, I wish this war ended quickly with the Ukraine's victory. Why quickly? Because Ukraine is suffering tremendously. I mean, you, you can't even imagine, uh, to put it bluntly, we are also somehow exposed uh, to Ukrainian propaganda. We don't know how many casualties there are on the Ukrainian side. At least we don't know that exactly. We don't know how many aircraft the Ukrainians have lost. We don't know exactly how many tanks they have lost, and so on and so forth. The suffering is unimaginable. And that's why I, yes, excuse me. And that's why I believe that, and I, I, I wish that this war ended quickly with Ukraine's victory and with Ukraine reconquering all those territories annexed and occupied by Russia since 2014, not since February 24th, 2022. Uh, Crimea is Ukrainian. I know it's, it's very difficult geopolitically and diplomatically to even talk about Ukraine recapturing Crimea because uh, many people say that that would lead immediately to nuclear escalation because then Putin would start behaving like a caged animal. Uh, I think he, he already is a caged animal and, I, and this is my personal view that if he, if he had wanted to use, for example, a tactical nuclear warhead in Ukraine, he would have done it months ago. He is afraid of doing this because it would be suicidal, not only politically, but also physically, because he would have to use a nuclear tactical weapon in Ukraine, exposing his own troops to contamination, to radiation and to death. And he knows very well what consequences that could bring to him as president of the Russian Federation. There was a question, excuse me, there was a question I, I forgot to answer uh, about Russia's or the Russian society's resilience and why we are uh, afraid of Russians with, uh, with all those demographic trends, for example, in Russia. I'll tell you why. If a single body bag was returned here to America, you would have headlines all over. In Russia, one human life doesn't matter. A hundred human lives don't matter either. A million lives don't matter. When I, was, when I mentioned those vestiges of Soviet mentality in today's Russia, I meant, among many other things, also that blatant disregard for human life and for human dignity. It's so Soviet. When you, and you probably heard or read reports about those mobile crematoria being brought to front lines in the initial stages of the war, do you imagine American mobile crematoria in Afghanistan just brought to that country in order to, to, to burn the bodies of fallen American soldiers? No. We save those lives. We evacuate soldiers from behind enemy lines. We evacuate their bodies. Like, uh, and, and this is a superb example, like the Israelis do, for example. I, I don't need to explain this to you. The Israelis have a particular obsession. But we, we, we so do we. So there is a, a, an, an abysmal difference between how we treat human life and how Russians do, and especially, I mean, not all Russians, of course, but uh, political elites nowadays in Russia. That's why th there is such, an, such a level of insensitivity among the Russian population. They are used to death. They are used to death. We are not used, we want to live. A day, don't care. And that's why, for example, they are so resilient, and that's why, for example, sanctions do not work properly, because they don't care. One final sentence. Um, 
sanctions usually work when you, when you hate the middle class, okay? Whether uh, it's Iran or, uh, or Cuba, but sanctions do not work where there is no middle class. And in Russia, the middle class is very, I mean, it's uh, almost non-existent because all those people who live in Moscow, in St. Petersburg today, who have always been wealthy since 1991, uh, they, stay, they, they can still afford to travel abroad. They can go to Turkey. They can go to, to the, the United uh, Arab Emirates to spend a very nice and very pleasant vacation there. So not much has changed in their lives since February 24th. And for all those people who have always lived in Siberia, in the remotest corners of the Russian Federation, not much has changed either because they have always lived in abject poverty. They have never been able to travel to Turkey or to the United Arab Emirates or even to Poland for a vacation. So they don't care. And that's why the Russian society is so resilient. With all due respect and with all my love for the Russian literature and for the Russian culture and for the Russian language, the Russians can survive on cabbage and potatoes. We can't. We can't. Mr. Ambassador, you alluded earlier to disagreements Poland had with other European countries about immigration. And I think as a result of those uh, disagreements, people who follow foreign affairs have an idea of what Poland doesn't want. But I wanted to hear what Poland's own vision for Im legal immigration to Poland is. Is it, is it important for your economy? Is there a Christian okay. obligation? Uh, I, I, I loved your use of the term legal immigration. I think it's key. It's absolutely fundamental in the entire debate about immigration, about all those subsequent waves of migration in Europe, not only in, in Poland. We have always adhered to international law. When you compare, for example, and it's a, uh, it's a recurrent and a very popular comparison between what we did, what the Polish government did, in the face of, that, uh, of the crisis we experienced uh, two years ago at the Polish-Belarusian border, with all those immigrants from Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq being literally pushed against the barbed wire of the Polish border by, uh, by um, uh, Belarusian border guards. Uh, now, if you compare those images with uh, those hundreds of thousands, if not millions, Ukrainian refugees standing in line, very disciplined, at, at Polish uh, uh, checkpoints and border crossings, waiting for the, uh, for the Polish border guards to let them in. in. In the first, just, I think it was 48 hours after the beginning of the Russian invasion against Ukraine, we set up eight reception centers in the vicinity of our border with Ukraine. It was a very smooth, very sad, of course, but, but also a very smooth operation logistically. It was quite an, an, an accomplishment uh, on our side. Now, what we want, uh, uh, to your point about uh, what Poland wants in terms of, of migration policies, we want uh, uh, procedures. We want legal immigration. We want people to enrich our economy. For example, uh, we could absorb those uh, subsequent waves of Ukrainian refugees uh, into the Polish society and into the Polish labor market also because our unemployment rate was ridiculously low. It's now between 3 and 5 percent. So we needed those people. It was not only because of our humanitarian approach. It's not only uh, about that, you know, that uh, the sympathy and that uh, outpouring of solidarity. It was also quite rational to admit those people. And about 95% of those uh, refugees were women and children, because we all know what the Ukrainian men are doing right now. 95%. And all those, almost all those women, up an arrival in Warsaw, Krakow, or Gdańsk, they were never expecting anything from, from, from the Polish government. They were saying, I, I, don't, I don't want welfare. I don't want an allowance. I don't want the Polish authorities to take care of myself and of my family. 
I want a job. And they were getting jobs because we had jobs aplenty, also for Ukrainian refugees. So they are enriching our society. They are contributing uh, tremendously to our uh, economy. I do believe that many of them will stay. Now we, were, we had one point, roughly 1.5 million Ukrainian economic migrants before the war. Now you have to combine uh, this figure with uh, another 1.5 million who arrived as refugees after the beginning of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So it's now about 3 million people of Ukrainian descent living and working in Poland. And the most important part, integrating smoothly into the Polish society. They, ne they learn the language in a matter of months, especially the children. But they, believe me, they, they, you, you can recognize a slight accent whenever you walk into a, a, a mall, for example, and you see a, and you meet a, a, a clerk and you know she is or he is Ukrainian. But the accent is, you know, almost unrecognizable. So they want to stay in Poland, they want to work in Poland, and they want to integrate into the Polish society. I, I don't know whether they, ha they already call themselves Poles. Uh, it's not the American model. Still, uh, it's a completely different model from what we can see now in many other Western European countries. Integration is key, regardless of the nationality, regardless of the skin color, regardless of faith, regardless of the country of origin. You want to integrate into the Polish society? You are most welcome. Finally, Poland, uh, and it's been for three or four years, Poland uh, has, uh, has been granting the largest number of work permits to foreign nationals uh, among all EU countries. For like five years, it's about uh, 600,000 people who work legally in Poland because the Polish government is granting them work permits. Uh, other countries in, in the European Union logging far behind Poland. We are open to immigration. The question is, what kind of immigration? Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador, <clears throat> Ambassador you, you, you've not only taken on every question and, uh, and, and given us uh, answers to think about, um, but you've left us with an aphorism, which I would not have expected aphorism. the aphorism yeah. and the, and that is uh pay, paying by watch paying by uh e-banking e um but let's not discuss kielbasa <laughs> so <laughs> i, I want to th thank you really sincerely for coming and talking to us tonight and bringing us up to date thank and you. we hope to have you back <laughs>